This is not Fogo Island, this is Labrador. I just want to give you a sense of how big these fish could get and the intimacy that as a people we have with the fish. And then this happened. The first one of these was built in the late 50s and you could see them all around Fogo Island. Every, just about every nation on earth had a fleet. And some of these fleets would come with hospital ships, supply ships that would make sure that the fishermen could go 24 hours a day without stopping. And so what do you think would happen? Well, this happened. Profits went up in fishing companies because landings were up. So if you look at 1968, the peak of the landings. So cause for celebration. This is a really good example of what happens when we extract natural resources without thought uh, to how much might be there. And when we do that, we call it income and we celebrate. Of course, what people weren't looking at at the time is a chart like this, which, of course, this, is, this information wasn't collected in real time, so it's really hard to judge the business people of the day. But look at that, 1968, the biggest drop in the biomass. And so in my life, uh, that played out in, by 1968, there were just no more fish at all for inshore fishing people. And so to get fish, you had to go further offshore. Joey Smallwood was the premier. He was the ultimate reductionist. And, and I can never resist speaking about him. Not well. <laughs> I, I always say, there, you will not find a Newfoundlander with a lukewarm opinion of Joey Smallwood. <laughs> and I think there's a special place in hell for Joey Smallwood. <laughs> because, I mean, not that he wasn't faced with a big problem of, you know, all along the coast of Newfoundland, tiny little settlements, some of them 50 people that were without running water, without education, and suddenly no fish, what to do? Well, that's, that will be a time you would think to ask some questions about what we might do. There's something called asset-based community development, ABCD. And all that is, is to say, what do we know? What do we have? What do we love? And what can we do with it? Well, he, he, that he wasn't about that. So Joey's answer was this, everybody move. And I think something like 65% of the outports of Newfoundland were resettled at that time. There's a beautiful song by a Newfoundland group called the Outport People. And the line in the song is, they moved without leaving and never arrived. I mean, this was a forced resettlement. Fogo Islanders didn't want to go because we were on our own little island and we didn't much trust what was going on in the mainland. This man who lives in Montreal, Colin Lowe, was a young filmmaker at the time working for the National Film Board. Memorial University invited the National Film Board to come to Fogo Island to see if they could help out. Because they understood the basic problem on Fogo Island at the time was we didn't know each other. We had no history of collaboration. And he made, Colin Lowe made 27 beautiful little films that have become known as the Fogo Process. And through that process of asking questions and, and engaging people in conversation, everything changed. It brought people together. The, the beautiful thing about the filmmaking and, and his process was it sort of short-circuited our brains, which were filled up with mistrust for each other, and sort of went straight to our hearts. I remember seeing a man from Deep Bay talking on the film and thinking, oh, you know, what a funny accent that man's got. And then realizing, wow, he's nervous, and wow, he could be my dad. And before you know it, like, you realize, wow, he's just like us. Anyway, we, we are on Fogo Island today because of those people. If you are having a bad day, go to the National Film Board website, look up this little film, The Children of Fogo Island. We adapted as Fogo Islanders with the leadership of the co-op uh, to a midshore fishery. So boats like this uh, that would go out for a night or two and come back. And we also had to adapt to other species. No, so now we fish for crab and shrimp. And being the northeast coast of Newfoundland, this is what they face to get out when the crab season opens. And so uh, Lambert was my father, and um, he didn't make that adaptation to the midshore because he was too old and he couldn't read and write, so he couldn't conquer the technology. But he, and he didn't die on Fogo Island, so a very sad story. But in any event, uh, he always said to us, you remember, the fish did everything they could to fight back. They multiplied at a younger age. They reproduced at way too young an age. But anyway, we went away because he said, well, you in Newfoundland at that time, you only bothered to get an education if you weren't any good for the fishery. And so but when there were no fish, you have to go get an education. I studied business because I wanted to understand what the heck happened with the fish, like who owned those companies and why did this happen? 
Everything you learn in business school you could, can be summed up in a cauliflower, <laughs> which, which is simply this. The w this could be a planet, a cauliflower. It's a beautiful fractal, right? It's a pattern that repeats. Fogo Island is a tiny little floret. Calgary's a bigger floret. New York's a bigger floret again. But we're all joined together, make no mistake about it, by the stem. And what happened to us in 1968, and that stem is our business systems and our regulation systems and distribution systems, were not serving that little floret very well. And they became deeply self-serving. And so the little florets start to die. And this is, I, I love this idea of the cauliflower because it's to get us, we should be thinking about the florets because that's where life lives. Those are communities. And we should be thinking differently and we should be optimizing for that. And, and the stem should adjust itself to the needs of the florets. So in business school or in business, my career was in finance. We're, we're always talking about capital, but we usually mean financial capital. But there's a beautiful book by a fellow named Charles Eisenstein called Sacred Economics. And you, you can add lots of bubbles to this. People will add spiritual capital to it. The idea of sacred capital is these are things that have emerged out of a specific set of circumstances that are essential to life and joy. And if we kill them, they're not easy to replace and perhaps not possible to replace. Then there's economic capital, which is hugely important, but not sacred. And the problems we face, I mean, we're all living together on this planet that's kind of on fire. We are not suffering from a lack of economic capital. We're suffering from the damage that's being caused to sacred capital. So I used to work for a man who come to work as a technology company every day, and he'd say, the most important thing is to keep the most important thing the most important thing. And he would go further and say, and if you don't know what that is, you should go home until you figure it out. Anyway. I think the most important thing was said by Schumacher in the 70s, so it shows my age, small is beautiful, nature and culture are the two great garments of human life. Nobody disagrees with that. And business and technology are the two great tools that can and should serve them, of course. So we have all of this, we have great tools. And what we're, the contortion we're trying to do now is to turn it around. So we have business as servant, technology as servant, and nature and culture as master. This man, uh, unfortunately, is passed away tragically. He was a professor, an American professor, who coined this phrase. He was actually a planner, uh, was, was what he was a professor of planning, and he coined this phrase, humanistic globalization. Of course, globalization. But how can we do it in a way that is more human and serves human needs? And, in me, and he calls for you know, a values revolution. And I think that's what we're all struggling with, is to, that's the revolution we have to make. And he also said, what we need to work toward is creating a global network of intensely local places. Because of course, what's been happening is a marginalization of the local. Even though we all live in the local, that's what affects our everyday life. So when I moved home uh, to start some projects to do something for home, because home had been kind of shrinking in terms of people and opportunities. And of course, when you get on that slippery slope, that's really hard. Um, and so with my brothers, we started a charity. I'm not all that interested in charity. I think nobody wants to be the recipient of charity, and it certainly isn't sustainable. I'm very interested in social business, and so I'm very interested in this idea of using philanthropic funds to create community-owned assets. And so we, um, thinking about what we might do and, and recognizing that anything we do uh, could make matters worse, that's the, the challenge with a wicked problem, we of course wanted to do something that was original, which simply means true to its origins, and had integrity, that m meaning that it was consistent and complete. And of course, done at home with all those 10 communities. And we get along better than we used to. And so we also remember this beautiful book. You know, it was set in Sicily at a time that the reigning social order had outlived its usefulness. And Lampedusa had this beautiful sentence, if you want things to remain the same, which of course we did. We wanted to stay home for one thing. We wanted to be able to have that relationship with home. Things have to change. And that's a hard thing for our human minds to get around. So we decided to do these four things. We started with art, and we set up a not-for-profit called Fogo Island Arts, which is a residency program for contemporary artists, professional artists. We have a gallery, and we do sh some shows. I think we did four shows last year, and we publish. And artists come for 
longest will be up to six months, but a number of months, and live in the communities and work in these lovely studios, which are off the grid outside of the communities. We, these are the things we hold on to every day. These are the markers we steer by, that place itself is not a commodity. And that we need to be mindful of how to properly engage with all of the human ways of knowing. And these different knowledge systems that exist in the world, how do we put them together? That, of course, life is a rhythm of opposites. And when it seems like a contradiction, just keep steering through, because it's actually a paradox, and you'll find away. It's very important to remember in small communities. And that community is a basic building block of human life, actually the basic building block of human life. Art is a way of asking. Art is a way of belonging. Art is a way of holding a question. Art is a way of thinking from first principles and a power of design. We have been building little wooden houses on Fogo Island for 400 years. Nobody much noticed. They notice now. That's a little wooden house on Fogo Island. And that businesses need to be not just for profit. Of course they do. And I think enlightened business people think about their businesses this way. Businesses are beautiful tools. And social business, of course. I'd like to think these circles are going to move together, so one day every business will be a social business. I don't think that's too Pollyanna. And we have to figure out how to stitch ourselves into the fabric of the bigger world. Um, great economist, avoiding the scourge of unemployment may have less to do with chasing after growth and more to do with building an economy of care, craft, and culture. And that growing an economy isn't just growing in quantity, but behaving in such a way that intensifies the good qualities in a place. Yes, we should expect a lot from a chair. It shouldn't be anonymous. You should know where the money goes. It should bring you not just comfort, but joy. I love this thing. Of, is it, I, I don't like the word sustainability because I don't really know what it means, but I like this. That an acceptance of precariousness is a prerequisite to permanence. And the most important thing said about the inn is that it's an act of human culture, which it is. I do believe this is the case. The next picture is not from Fogo Island. I don't know why we build this. Well, I kind of know. And I think it's because our human minds overfocus on things that we can measure. So back to Gil Chin Lim. Can we build a, a global network of intensely local places? I think we can. I think these, these kinds of tools will help. In my lifetime, we've gotten food labeling. So now you can decide if you're going to have that second bowl of cereal every morning. You know what's in it. Imagine if we did this, that everything we buy had a little label that tells you where the money goes. Simple as that. And all those problems we're trying to solve with our charitable undertakings would actually get solved by the way we purchase. This can be done. It just needs the accountants to step up to the plate. Anyway, to wind down, we are all, each and every one of us, responsible for the creation of our communities. It's everyday work, every day, every day, and it's not easy. But what matters is what we do. And everything that everyone does matters. Even the tiniest little change can make big change. And a poem to leave you with from a New Zealand poet. It's a very long poem, but we only have one stanza, which is the art of walking upright is the art of using both feet. One is for holding on, and one is for reaching out. And that's what, as small communities, we're trying to figure out how to do. And that's really what our projects are about. Thank you very much.